Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the final match of the 2024 Speed Chess Championship Finals. It's Magnus Carlsen versus Ali Reza Firuja. Magnus took down Hans Niemann to get here, and Ali Reza Firuja took down Hikaru Nakamura. And this is the first final of a Speed Chess Championship that will not feature both Magnus and Hikaru. It's Magnus versus Firuja. So many thoughts. I'm not sure many of you knew this, because not a lot of people were watching chess yet. But in April of 2020, one month after the world shut down and online tournaments were getting played, Ali Reza Firuja, at the age of 16, defeated Magnus Carlsen in what was called the Banter Blitz Cup. That was a final match, and he beat him 8.5, 7.5. He was 16 years old. April 2020. The first chess boom of the Queen's Gambit happened in October. So probably this was not really something that was getting recommended in the videos on uh, YouTube at the time. Uh, and so this has been a rivalry budding for many years. And I will talk about the match. Uh, very quickly, I just want to say thank you to everybody who showed up live here in Paris. I met hundreds of fans. And uh, if you were there, write it in the comment section. Talk about it. Post on Instagram. Tag me if you can. Um, same on, you know, Twitter. Uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to take a look and, and just kind of reminisce. It was very special to have a live audience. Uh, amazing team here of my fellow talent. Um, the people on camera and, and, and the whole production team, just really great stuff. Some production issues, of course, the board being a little bit buggy, the screen freezing, us having to go to bird's eye. I get all of that. I really wish it could be perfect every single time, but the goal for me, uh, as I suppose some form of a leading, you know, channel on, in this subject matter is to get chess somehow into a bigger arena like a real serious esport, I can't wait. Uh, those of you watching back home, the live stream, amazed to hear your support. And I want to quickly comment on something. You know, I was uh, asked to commentate the final. You know, for all of these events, you get your schedule. And my schedule said that I would be commentating the final match alongside Daniel Naraditsky. To me, those are big shoes to fill because I was basically filling the shoes of Robert Hess. And I have spoken very openly about the fact that Daniel and Robert are the gold standard. Uh, they are the only two commentators I can listen to for four hours straight. I'm not saying my opinion has to be your opinion, but for four hours in a row, chess commentators are good. There's a lot of excellent ones. I'm not going to name all the names because if I forget one, then I'm going to look like I'm doing it on purpose. There are many, many, many excellent commentators. Those two, to me, are the gold standard. So I had to fill Robert's shoes and Honestly, I wasn't even that comfortable doing so because as a caster, I'm confident in my skills. But I am a better recapper. I, th I like to be at the desk. I like to make quick points. I like to ask questions. I like to interview. Um, but it went great. And it's almost deceiving sometimes because some of you sit in the live chat and write such vile things. And in general, live stream chat is really, really awful. And if you go to like Reddit chess, it's hit or miss. Some positive, some negative, but they really don't like me there. They don't like that I replaced Robert Hess. I'm not good enough as, as a chess player as Robert Hess, and I miss things, for sure. I get accused of making commentary about myself. You could argue I'm making this introduction about myself. Well, it's my channel, so suck it up, bozos. But I don't try to make anything about myself. So after the show, a bunch of the production team, a bunch of people close to me sent me messages like, that was an incredible show. You and Naraditsky were firing on all cylinders. And it put things into perspective that you should only take feedback and criticism from people who mean well and who you respect. And so many of you are positive. So many of you watch without saying anything just because you're enjoying the show and you're not writing anything. And I got to remember that like the scum of the earth that sits in the live chat and says horrible things doesn't reflect the reality. This is a PSA for anybody that wants to make any sort of content and you're gonna get feedback from these anonymous voices and blobs that throw whatever they want at you. That's all I have to say right now. Um, it was really special, I really enjoyed, and to me, Robert and Dania are still uh, the best, but I hope we uh, made you happy. I hope we put on a good show for all of you, and let's get into uh, the matchups. Matchup, not matchups. So, it all started with a draw. It was a very tense first game. And this is game number two. It, wasn't a, it was a Spanish. 
Magnus opened up playing a lot of e4, e5, playing symmetrically with black and looking to hunt a little bit more with the white pieces. a6, knight f6, and d3 and b5. So Magnus staying to his true and tried, uh, which is delaying the movement of the d-pawn in the Spanish, sometimes trying to go d5 right away if white had played c3, but because this is a d3 Spanish, we're not going to be getting that. h3, d6, c3. And the reason why Magnus now played like this is because he wants to play knight b8. This is known as the Briar variation. Magnus has played everything under the sun, but something, the Briar is a very long-term kind of game. It's going to be a long maneuvering game. The knight is going to go here, the bishop is going to go here, and then we're going to see. So we have knight d2, knight d7. You see, bishop b7, right? Knight f1, knight c5 targeting the bishop, and now rook to e8. And rook to e8 is a preparatory move, anticipating that something will happen in the center relatively soon. B4 kicks the knight out, now bishop b3. By the way, at this point, Hans Niemann had joined the show, which is quite uh, quite fascinating. He did a little bit of commentary alongside um, alongside Daniel, and um, I think he covered this game in great detail. Here, Magnus immediately went for counterplay, and actually Hans pointed out that the move b4 was a bit strange for this pawn structure because immediately black would get this a5 break, so sharp, and now d5, and c5. So every single pawn got to go forward, and this is quite rare in these types of structures. So Magnus enjoying an early space advantage, and after the clearing out of a bunch of pieces, you know, Magnus does have the target, and he has a, a better target here on d3 than the one standing on e5. So queen b2, it doesn't really matter. Ali Reza is really, I mean, it's the Spanish. The worst you can get is a worse position. Sorry, the worst you can get is like an equal position, even if you just, you know, are, are maneuvering your pieces in an inaccurate way. But after a bunch of maneuvering, Rook takes e4 on the board, and Magnus pressuring for the majority of this game. Uh, we get to the 40th move, it's still around equal, and suddenly Ali Reza gives up his h3 pawn, but goes for a counterplay, uh, gets into an endgame, but Magnus holds everything, and Ali Reza just loses the pawn. You'll notice the two seconds on the clock, bishop c3, b4, defended by the bishop, and now you know, Ali Reza tries, but he simply can't create any counterplay with his rook and his bishop. Rook e1, pawn takes... It's just a matter of technique. The pawn goes to b2, so the white rook has to stay exactly where it is. He queens, and this is easy. Very, very instructive how Magnus makes the queen, trades the rooks, wins this, and this is easy. There are many endgames where king, bishop, and one pawn are also winning, uh, but for that, many criteria have to be met, and here you don't need any criteria because you have a two-pawn advantage. Ali Reza doesn't want any part of this, and he simply resigns the game. And this was the first win, and I saw this while Hans was commentating, and I thought, oh, Magnus wins the second game of the match. Like, here we go. And, you know, another interesting thing um, beforehand uh, was the fact that... Um, uh, was the fact that no match at the Speed Chess Championship had been close, right? Like every match. Hans lost to Magnus by five, but it was really, you know, it was a lot bigger than that. He lost to Hikaru by 12, and Ferruccio beat Hikaru by a pretty big score, 16 to 11, but okay, like obviously, you know, it was never really close. He led the whole time, so you kind of got to wonder like, uh-oh, is Magnus going to run away with this thing? He beat Hans 7 to 2 in the 5 plus 1, and this, you know, this is the king versus the prince. This is, this is Ali Reza, the one that beat Magnus eight and a half, seven and a half in April of 2020, back when, <laughs> back when not many people were watching chess. That was the Banter Blitz Cup final held on chess 24. Uh, and, uh, you know, e5, h6 was the setup that Ali Reza was choosing in the King's Indian. h6 is a super rare move, a move that... I've barely ever seen, and I mean, the, the, the simple point of h6 is just to prevent anything in the white position from going to the g5 square. We had queen c2, and this was a, uh, this was a very instructive game as Ali Reza put the knight on f4, and then he played f5, and this is exactly the type of position that a King's Indian player wants. He wants to create same side attacks. Magnus played f3, Ali Reza went g5, and I think Magnus knew right away he needs to not let Ali Reza get these types of positions. He really needs Ali Reza not to have fun while they're playing each other. So he traded, he played rook c1, which is common in these positions. You're trying to create play on the, on the queen side. But bishop to a6 came out. And this is not where this bishop is generally supposed to be positioned. The bishop's supposed to escort the pawns, but there are no more pawns to escort. So Ali Reza just got an incredible position. That bishop living in Magnus's territory. Very unpleasant stuff. I'm gonna drink some of my uh, mango lassi. By the way, got a little bit of uh, got a little bit of Indian food delivered here. You know, buttered chicken. You know how it is. Um, mm. Also, 
Paris has garlic naan, which is a big thing in America. I don't know if it's a big thing in India, but garlic naan um, with cheese. Like, I don't know. Delicious. It was really spectacular. Westernized version, I don't know, but uh, so tasty. By the way, look at this position. Absolutely swarming Magnus. And Ali Reza couldn't quite put the nail in the coffin in this game. Like, they both got to a minute, and it was somehow still even. Like, Magnus wouldn't lose. Shocking. 32-30 rating. Uh, and then it got into a really big scramble as both guys got really low on time. 14 and 30. And Ali Reza kept pressuring and pressuring, but suddenly he gave up his advantage. We got into an end game. He's up a pawn, but, you know, the pawn's not necessarily going to be decisive. But Magnus ultimately panics, trades the bishop, and this is simply losing because you play knight c3 and the pawn's going to queen. It does. And now he wins in a very instructive way. By the way, important to note, knight and bishop versus bishop is a draw. You, you cannot win like that. You need at least one of the pawns, and then you need to escort it down the end of, uh, to the end of the board. Knight d5, knight e7, and um, one pawn remained, and actually here Magnus just straight up lost on time. Although after knight e7, you know, he could have taken on g5, and he it probably as a practical decision, this was the best thing to do. Uh, the reason for that being Ali Reza would have had seven seconds on the clock with one second bonus time to get this checkmate. We would have, you know... Could have seen how good his technique was, uh, but he does win, and he he strikes back immediately. And, um, you know, they get to playing again. We have another e4, e5, and Ali Reza plays this Italian. Magnus plays knight f6, h6, bishop to e7. This is this is not common. Uh, if you check the database with pawn to h6, stopping anything on g5, you know, what people do here after h6 is they generally play d6, and then they go for g6 or g5. So black likes to either put the bishop on g7, uh, or or play g5 and be aggressive, and it's actually not horrendous, but h6 and bishop e7 is, is, is quite something. Then we got castles, castles. Both guys played on the queen side, not letting the other take any space. We had queen on b3, right? So Ali Reza played queen b3. Magnus went back to h7 and is trying to maybe do something on this side of the board. There it is. Knight goes to g5. Bishop f6. And you kind of got the sense here, like... What's going on? Now, Ali Reza immediately advances in the center the second Magnus leaves. Rook d1, queen e7, and the bishop drops back. And b6, the bishop goes back to c4 because I guess it's, you know, supposedly looking to go to the d5 square. Rook b8, takes, takes, takes on g5. And here, Neriditsky was telling me during the commentary, he thinks that h takes g5 is the best practical decision because after h takes, you could potentially create some sort of attack or you can put the knight on f4. But then we got bishop takes, and that bishop just somehow never really participated. And then here Magnus chose a bad plan. He tried to trade, but this allowed this knight to come to e3, and he just suffered the whole game. Ali Reza made slow, improving moves, and at some point, king g7, uh, h4, h5, rook d1, right here, um, something wild happened. I was going on a whole monologue about how Magnus is so careful when he moves his pawns and he like really generally doesn't like to make pawn moves, especially, you know, considering they weaken the position. And then he thought for five seconds and went G5. And, and this just simply loses because it creates way too many weaknesses. Now, I suppose Magnus only calculated HG, Bishop G5, in which case... He's right. This is fine. But that's not what happens. And we get rook d6, which is the best move by Ali Reza. And he's threatening to not just take the pawn, he's threatening to take the bishop and get the knight to the f5 square. And rook d6 is just simply game over. Uh, suddenly, white's position is way too strong. There's nothing you can do about it. G takes h4, he takes on c6. Magnus decides to, you know, try to go all in. But rook takes c8, sacrificing the rook. You take... But when it's all said and done, uh, one guy's up a bishop. Now, a great move. Queen c2, allowing queen takes g3. And here comes the queen to the second rank. There it is, playing defense. And now we have cleanup. The doubled h-pawns do not leave a strong impression. Ali Reza, absolutely smooth like butter. Chicken. And uh, he takes a 2.5 to 1.5 game lead. This was huge. Ali Reza pulling out to an early lead in this match. And... In the very next game, um, it was uh, it was a King's Indian again. It was d4 knight f6. 
I apologize. Wait. This was the game for Rouge 1. Yes. Yes, everything is everything is accurate. Knight c3. Remember, Ali Reza was playing the uh the King's Indian with h6. Rookie one, bishop f1. All very normal stuff. Takes takes. Right? And now this time Magnus chooses a different approach. So rookie one and bishop f1. We will go back to the previous game. Just tr try to compare the two. So in this game, Magnus chose Queen c2 and d5, right? He played queen c2, d5, as opposed to rookie one and bishop f1. Here he chooses rookie one and bishop f1, so he doesn't go d5. He keeps the tension. Ali Reza plays a5. Magnus goes pawn takes. And here. So now he does a completely different thing. In this game, he locked the center and made it a fight. And in this game, he kept the center a little bit more open, so Ali Reza couldn't conjure up as strong of an attack. So we got knight to a4. Right, we got bishop to e3, and this was kind of a weird game because Ali Reza couldn't quite decide what he wanted. He had a lead, right? And c6 stops knight d5, but that was not really the plan. Actually, b6 and maybe knight c5 was the way to go in this position to try to trade here, and that's how the first game of the match went. The first game of this match was a draw, but here he goes here. Knight h5 generally comes with the idea of putting the knight on f4, but after knight to f4, white just goes rook d1 and c5, and this maneuver completely shuts down Ali Reza's queenside. So it's like Ali Reza jumped out to this lead and then almost relaxed for a second, and the second that he relaxed, Magnus just absolutely brutalized him. Like he played c5, knight b6, just complete domination over there, Knight takes, he just got rid of the bishop. Without the light squared bishop, it's known that King's Indian positions are quite bad. B6, and here, Magnus needed to play a little bit more accurately. He took an f4, because what could be more natural, of course, than you simply getting your bishop recaptured in like two seconds? But actually here, bc5, counterattacking the rook would have been quite nice. Okay, the position is still better for white, but takes. Now e5, and... This was just a horrendous position for Black. And, and I mean, it really felt like Ali Reza won the previous game and then, like, really relaxed. Just kind of put his pieces on squares absentmindedly. And again, I'm not insulting the guy. I'm a huge fan. But he kind of chilled. And then it was a great position for, um, for, uh, for White, who just put the pressure. Magnus just made improving moves. And he actually took a lot of time. He could have played a little faster. Like, he, he really, like, rookie 7 here, it took Magnus a full minute to play bishop takes f7. I think he was calculating rookie 8. But, okay, he took on f7 with check, played rook d7, and it, then he, for whatever reason, like, got to a minute on the clock, but it was never in doubt. The pawn is simply too strong. And uh, bishop e6, queen d4, and he checks a couple of times. He picks up, like, all the pawns and gets to the back rank, and he wins. And so... He even the match, and right around this moment, I had told my legendary co-host, um, I was like, Ali Reza needs to lock in, you know, because I really felt like here he won this beautiful game. He got two wins in a row against Magnus. Now it's two and a half, two and a half. And, you know, he did. He really did lock in, because in the next game, he went e4, e5, and it was in Italian. This time, Magnus played bishop c5 instead of putting the bishop on e7. And Ali Reza played his patented bishop to g5. Ali Reza really likes this system where black is um, baited into playing h6, g5 himself. And uh, he didn't do that. He played h6, d6, a6. So he kind of refused to put the pawn on g5. Every single engine line here for black says to play g5 or else this pin is simply too strong. So knight d2, bishop a7. A4 stops B5, and he's still refusing to play G5. B4, he's still refusing to play G5. At this point, it's minus 0.1 if Black literally plays G5, by the way, which is kind of crazy. So I think Magnus' whole thing was like, I'm not going to play his game, even if it's according to the engine, better for my opponent. I'm just going to play my game. Knight C4, Queen E6, but guess what? After B5, Knight E7, this trade in Rook B1... Ali Reza just got an excellent position. He clearly understands these positions with the bishop on g5, like, very, very well. And he's very good at calculating and maneuvering through this. And here's something completely not to happen. Magnus took on b5. 
Now, if I asked you between the two, like, keep in mind, Weiss' last move was rugby one. So, you know, rook, rook b5 attacks the pawn on b7, right? Yeah. And he had just played rook b1. He went rook b5. And here, Magnus was really distraught. He was really, really annoyed. And it was like, what did he miss? I mean, the pawn is hanging. And like, if you play b6, you hate your bishop. If rook b8, I mean, the guy's just going to make some improving moves and go win your pawn. I mean, he looked really annoyed, and I just did not understand. Like, what did he miss? I don't... Guy's 2,800 fide and 3,200 online. Like, I don't know what he had missed. It goes rook b8. And Alibrisa just goes straight for the pawn, obviously, and takes on b7. And here, knight g6. And now some weird stuff started happening. So the threat is obviously some sort of counterattack on the king. You can't take the bishop because you lose the queen. So Ali Reza thought here for two minutes. For two minutes, he stared at this position. And he went here. And then he went here. And actually, his advantage is gone. Queen c2 is a little bit more accurate. And it's because after knight f4, uh, you have g3. And everything is kind of protected in your position. So the knight can't really rush to f4. And also, queen c2 sets up just, in general, d4 at some moment. As well as rook b1 always being available for a trade. Queen d1 is not as good of a move. But here... You know that your opponent is going to play knight to f4. I don't know why you don't go here. Black is going to go d5. And you can take, but you can also just come back. And, you know, black might go h5. I might even consider h4. And king g2. So Ali Reza spent two minutes... And here for reasons I can't explain. I do not know. I have absolutely no idea. G3 stops Black's plan. Instead, he goes here. And he tries to fight against Knight F4 with D4. Now Magnus is actually better. He misses how to be better. But all his pieces get in. His queen, his bishop, his knight, and his rook. And Ali Reza's got eight seconds. And blunders queen g6. Magnus leaves the rook to hang. Queen g2 is a huge threat. Knight h3 is a huge threat. And all of a sudden, rook f2, queen e6, and Magnus is winning. And it's six seconds to two minutes. This was an Italian where Magnus deliberately didn't play the critical line because he didn't want to play into Ferruccia's style and knowledge. Got a worse position. Made a move that was like a horrendous mistake according to his reaction. And then just... He, he, he just, Ali Reza just let him off the hook and he loses this game in an absolutely shocking turn of events. And I got another game here for you. This was the, the very next game. So this was a King's Indian. Bishop e2, d5. We've seen this all before. By the way, Magnus chooses the same setup, rookie one, right? And, and in the previous game, uh, we had we had a5. So around this point, I told Danya, like, look, what just happened? Ali Reza just took a one-game lead in this match. In the very next game, he kind of played with house money, like in this King's Indian game. He played with house money, and he got a losing position within 15 moves. And then in this game, he plays c6. And d5 now is much stronger than it was in the first game that I showed you because d5, there was no pawn on c6. But this structure, with the rook on e8, there is no f5 now. It simply doesn't work. a6, Magnus stops b5 as well, and just the knights are stuck behind each other. And in the game that I just showed you, he got a losing position like 15 to 20 moves. This one's also completely lost. White is just totally winning. Because in the King's Indian, you either get this going, you get something in the center, or you get something on the queen side. 
And here you have nothing. You do not have anything. Knight to f4. Magnus takes. It's not even it's not even the best move because here Ali Reza can get the bishop into the game. Magnus tried to go straight down, but it doesn't work. But Queen c3 played quite quickly because on the heels of the game that he played quite slowly. Queen c3 is a fork, but he just blunders Queen b7. And you cannot take the knight on e5 because the rook on a8 is hanging and Queen f7 is a threat. We have this. And Magnus just very perfectly backs up. Happy to give away his center pawn because his a pawn pan is so strong. And here Ali Reza just resigns because everything is winning. So we go from Ali Reza up a game after a beautiful game to playing a kind of a dodgy King's Indian and just sort of letting Magnus get back into it. Losing a game with, with White, you know, um, which was, uh, which was mind-blowing. Just absolutely, he was, he was just winning this game. And then losing another game almost instantly in a King's Indian. And that was it. That was the match. Magnus continued to win in a variety of beautiful ways. Uh, Magnus won a game in, in, a, in a Nimso Indian. That, like, just, just look at this game. So, Ali Reza changed to D4 for an opening. Magnus played the Nimso Indian. A3. Ali Reza played the setup with F3 and E4. This is called the Samish. Magnus played Bishop A6. And again, Ali Reza played Bishop G5. Very provocative move, provoking pawn play. Look at how Magnus handled this. He just developed all his pieces. Ali Reza did not know the critical move in the opening. And he got a worse position with white in like 13 moves. Black castle. So all of black's pieces have moved except the rook on H8. But none of white's pieces have moved off their home squares. So... He starts breaking apart the position, and we had queen f3, takes, takes. Ali Reza down two minutes again. Look at this. Knight to f4 is beautiful. Trying to utilize the h uh, file and the first rank. You can't really take the knight. Bishop h7 here is the only move. You get the bishop out of the way, and you block the trade. Ali Reza does not find it, and after the dust clears, rook f8, king e3, black, black is just totally winning. And... There was a sequence from two and a half to one and a half, all the way up to six and a half, two and a half. Magnus just won a bunch of games in a row, and it never stopped. It never stopped. He won this match. It took Ali Reza Faruja about another 90 minutes to win a game. Magnus in this match led by as many as... I think the end. I mean, the end. The end. The end is yeah. The bullet. He ran away with it. But during the blitz, Magnus's biggest lead was like ten, literally ten, and he ended the three plus one. I think up fourteen to five, and the final score of this match was twenty three and a half to seven and a half. And he wins the speech chess championship. I mean, of course, look, there was more games, but it was over in the five plus one. And then it was really over in the three plus one and the bullet was the bullet. And he breaks the record for the largest margin of victory in a final, breaking the record of Hikaru, who I think won 22 to eight over Wesley So or 23 to eight over Wesley So. This really proved that Magnus Carlsen, when he's motivated, when the lights are the brightest, literally in that arena, hundreds of fans around yelling, that's when he thrives. When he's got a guy against him, Ali Reza Firuja, who he has touted as the only person that he would play in a world championship match in 2022, a guy who he's had a rivalry with for many, many years. He really enjoys playing Ali Reza in Blitz and in Bullet. They've played many, many games. He's probably played thousands of games against each other. But he showed up today, and the best example that I can give, it's like Novak Djokovic. Like, sometimes you just gotta... Not, not this year. Not this year. Although he did win a Grand Slam, I think, this year. Um, or maybe... No, he didn't. But he got into a final. But that's, you know, it's an equivalent... And um, Magnus is still pretty young. He's 33. Like, he's really, he's not old. But 
quite funny that he plays Firuja and Hans, but he doesn't play Hikaru. He never played Hikaru, and um, yeah, just special to see. Really special. What more can I say? Uh, he wins the whole thing. I already reflected on the event in the intro of this video, and I just want to thank you all once again for, for the support. Uh, and um, I'm flying back to New York tomorrow. The future content on this channel is going to be preparation for the Pia Kramling match that I'm playing October uh, 28th to November 2nd. A lot of you think I'm going to get destroyed in that match. Uh, a lot of you are entitled to your absolutely moronic opinions. No, I'm just kidding. I actually have no idea how I'm going to do in that match, and that's what scares me. Just like how Magnus was afraid that if he showed up and didn't play his best against Verusha, he would get destroyed. So, I'm going to rest, get rejuvenated. Uh, my sleep schedule here in Paris was falling asleep at 5 a.m. because I was, like, all over the place and working the entire day, waking up at noon, and then I would go, uh, you know, work for, for the production. So, what a wild time. Uh, watch my interviews with the players if you haven't already, and um, that's all I have for you right now. Congrats to Magnus. Congrats to Ferrugia on a second place finish. The Chess Olympiad uh, begins in a couple of days, and then it's a crazy end of the year, a World Championship and World Rapid and Blitz Championship, so... I'm tired. You guys are great. Get out of here.